Hi, everybody. Welcome along to Percussion Discussion, episode 70. Uh, please check out our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, our world famous YouTube channel. Uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to that, it only takes a second and it really helps us out. And this way, it means you don't miss any of the amazing interviews that we've already done or any of the fabulous ones that we've got coming up. So if you could do that, be very, very grateful. If you prefer to listen on the go, then you will find all of our conversations in podcast form. You can find those on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. So if that's your thing, check it out. Please leave us a review. Again, it really, really helps to grow, um, to grow our channel and uh, get it out there to more people. So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined today by um, a, an incredible musician, um, a, a percussionist at the very, very uh, top of his game. Um, I recently interviewed Thomas Lang. Uh, he spoke in depth about his recent um, PASIC performance alongside the gentleman that I've got with me today. So I've got both sides, both perspectives. Um, a gentleman who studied percussion uh, to, to incredible depths and lengths, if you like, um, a real specialist in Southern Indian percussion. It gives me great, great pleasure to welcome the fabulous Mr. Pete Lockett. So Pete, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it, mate. Thanks, Matty. Great, great to be on. You know, I'm, I'm I was excited when you when you emailed. So good that we've uh, good that we got it together, and here we are. Absolutely. So it's great to have you, and, and I really appreciate it, especially this close to Christmas. I'm sure there's uh, a million other things you could be doing at the moment. Well, I've got my beard. You know, I've got to go out and do a few parcel deliveries. You know, the, <laughs> down the chimney. So you, you're not quite up to Lee Sklar standards yet, though. I have to say, but you know, keep working. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a good, a good place for me to start, Pete, and hopefully you as well, is uh, a yeah. recent collaboration that you did with the fabulous Thomas Lang over at PASIC. Um, as, you, as you know, Thomas was on as a guest a few weeks ago, and he gave us his amazing perspective of it, and it'd be great if you could, you could give yours. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, first of all, to work with, with Thomas is, is uh, you know, besides being a great honour, it's just a massive a massive pleasure and a pleasure and a challenge obviously because he, he's such a uh, such an amazing drummer he's got such um such detailed facility i mean there are lots of drummers who have got amazing facility and amazing technique but i think there are very few that have the detail that that thomas has and the precision it's 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 otherworldly actually for for me i think it's amazing and funnily enough it's something that you um that you find quite often in in, in um, Indian tabla players because they spend so long, um, you know, practicing and nailing stuff and and like really getting into extreme extreme technical detail. Um, so for me, it was it was kind of just on that technical level. Of course, the musical level as well. We will get to in a minute. But on that technical level, was quite a, a great um, juxtaposition with the Indian and and you know. What, what Thomas does so it was a it was kind of a perfect um match yeah in in that sense and of course you know I've known I've known Thomas for for um for years I mean on the on the drum festival circuit you know you, you kind of get to know everyone over a period of time you know them as people and you know they're playing in their compositions and and so you know the, to get the chance to actually set this up with Thomas was uh you know just uh you know like a dream for me really especially after you know, not doing anything for 18 months and then bang into such an amazingly challenging and, and, and exciting musical collaboration. Yeah. I mean, I know um, it was, the choice of drummer was yours. Pasek had said, who do you want to do it with? Because uh, it was yeah. your, your yeah. thing, wasn't it? Was there ever any doubt that it was going to be? Exactly. Yeah. It was always going to be Thomas. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's... it's um, it's just the obvious, the obvious choice because of the you know the technique and the and the the musicality and the and the mind, uh, you know, to be able to get inside all of the the complex rhythms and not just get inside of the complex rhythms to be able to reinterpret them. That's one of the things that's um, super exciting for me. I mean, it's all well and good playing something, playing it in unison, and you know that's great. You know, it's very effective. But Thomas gets inside it and and reinterprets and rebuilds it from the inside out. And it, you know, it, it's, it just creates a completely different um, perspective on the material. And I love that. I love that when a collaboration comes together and, and the material becomes 
um, you know, completely renewed and, and given a whole new lease of life with, with that, um, you know, artistic interpretation of, of, uh, of the material. Yeah, because I, I know you both contributed, didn't you, to it, obviously remotely with, with restrictions and what have you. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of work gone in in advance from you both. Absolutely. And also, you know, I mean, it was what, you know, not just my tracks, there was a, it was a, a, an equal balance of Thomas's tracks and, you know, they're, they're hard, man. You know, I mean, they're hard to, um, you know, challenging on every level to get them down and to, and to come up with something that's, that's, uh, you know, meaningful for his tracks, you know, it's a, a, you know, involved building a particular setup that I'd never had before and, and just really thinking about how to, um, you know, approach the tracks. And of course, then we didn't have any, um, we didn't have any rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So the idea was originally that I'd go to LA for a week, we'd rehearse, then we'd go to Pacing. But because of the travel ban, which luckily, um, or unluckily, however you might look at it, but luckily for the project, unluckily for the rehearsals, the travel ban to, the, to America ended two days before the gig. So literally we had an hour in the, in the hotel room yeah. On the you know the day before and then bang on stage with with virtually no sound check it must be said and, and I must add as well if you haven't seen the Thomas interview uh, the, the the rehearsal in the, in the hotel room was minus instruments it was just on pillows or, or what have you wasn't it there was no no instruments yeah. oh, <laughs> luckily luckily Vic Firth do some pillows so. <laughs> yeah, Vic first do some pillows now, so that's. Uh... <laughs> oh dear me, I, I just can't imagine uh, the, the stress of that. And it, obviously, you get to the day, and you've not, you've not had the chance to to try out all your ideas on. Obviously, you've rehearsed them I I at home in studios, but it's yeah, not, it's not the same, is it? Yeah. As having, you know, it's that... it's not the same. And, and to be honest, you know, I mean, once you know, it was kind of like a, a live first rehearsal, really, the gig, and it, it went very well. We, you know, we're both, you know, pretty pretty pleased with how it turned out, all things considered. But, you know, once we do a string of gigs, you know, it's going to be, you know, you know, orchestration, lots and lots of different things that that, that we didn't get chance to discuss. Um, you know, that'll all get sort of, um, you know, finely tuned, shall we say, as, as we, uh, as we, develop the project which hopefully you know we'll be on the road with it you know i can't really see much happening next year but um, sure. certainly 2023 hopefully you know well let, let's hope it does happen but and, and another thing that fascinates me is the equipment that you would have used over there was probably just given to you on the day it's probably not your regular stuff i'd imagine as well so you've yeah and it and it and it was a um it was a completely different different setup as well, like uh, stuff, a setup that I've never used before. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very big setup. What I'll do is I'll, I'll pop some pictures over, then you can, you know, maybe pop them into the interview if you, Please do, if yeah. you want, or, or we can download them on the, on the page. A picture and a, and a, a, a diagram of, of, uh, sure. of the setup, you know. But of course then Thomas has, you know, got a, a massive rig as well. So it's a, a pretty big technical challenge all in all, I would say. Wow, it just it just fascinates me. It really does. And then you get, I am assuming, not a lot of a sound check because there's loads of things going on. It's it's kind of action packed, basic, isn't it? You know. Well, yeah, we, we were on after a Matt Garska, and um, so we we had fifty minutes. Yeah. So to set up, there's no rolling risers. Rolling risers would you know would have been a, a godsend actually yeah. in that in that uh, scenario. So no rolling risers. So. You know, there's a whole team of basic people that have, that have get the gear on the stage. So it's literally build the build the rig, um, you know, sound check the whole thing, uh, get the mics, everything in in. Well, it was like 40 minutes we had. So that's with material that you've never played together before. There's pretty heavy duty. Life on the edge. I, I, I mean, and and the, and the thing that always fascinates me. I, I'm no percussionist at whatsoever. I'm not much of a drummer, but I'm definitely not a percussionist. Um, but when <laughs> you're that. <laughs> when you're alongside a powerhouse like Thomas, now obviously with percussion, not not every percussion instrument is is remarkably loud. I'd imagine monitoring yeah. and in ears must be so incredibly important to you to hear what you're, yeah. uh, you know, what you're creating. Um, that yeah, but that's 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 also where the where the orchestration comes in as yeah. well. Yeah, the orchestration of which instruments go with which 
Uh, you, you know, some instruments are surprisingly, like bongos, for example, mm. um, cut through so much. It, you'd think, well, it's a smaller instrument. It's going to be really hard to project. But bongos is one of the instruments that cuts through more than yeah. more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. It's just the frequency. So orchestration is, is super important in the whole thing. Of course, of course, yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, will there be some official footage that comes out? out there will be. There will be. We, we're gonna. We have to get round to it. We've got the video from yeah. from um, from Pasic, the actual video that they shot. So um, we're, we're kind of a little bit limited to how much of it we can put out. So um, we got want to digest it for a bit and then see. We'll probably put together a little, you know, mini show reel of it or something. Um, to TBC, not well. BBC. No, oh no. Well, we'll wait with uh, we'll wait anxiously for that. I think that'll be worth the wait, won't it? So yeah, hopefully. <laughs> you know, you've done. You're kind of like um, <laughs> you're kind of like the Swiss Army knife of of percussionists. <laughs> uh, uh, in the nicest, uh, I mean that. In the yeah, nicest. yeah. No, great. It's a good. It's a good terminology. I like it actually. <laughs> but, you know, you you've, you literally will play any any style. I mean, you must. have... The thing that fascinates me, fascinates me is how much work has gone into, especially the Southern Indian stuff. Yeah. Mean, it's a life's work and it's still, I'm sure it still is, you know, you never, you never know it and yeah. you go, that's it, I know it all now. But I mean, it's well documented that you started kind of late on in, in life um, as, a, as a drummer. And yeah. How soon did the percussion take over from that, Pete, if you like it? Well, it was, an, it was an accidental thing, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, I, like they said, I started late. I started at 19, Portsmouth, where I come from. A couple of years later, moved to London, um, you know, rock bands and this and that, you know, the Greyhound and the Half Moon in Putney and all that kind of circuit. Um, and then by chance, you know, I came across the, um, there was a tabla gig. It was a free it was a free gig. It was, you know, the, the great Zaki Hussain and the, the late great uh, Ali Akbar Khan plays an instrument called the Sirod. It was an amazing instrument. Um, and that was like, that blew me away. It was like, just if you've never seen Tabla before, all that music at all, and then you suddenly into this, uh, you know, it was a big auditorium, uh, just to walk in and it's going on. It was just literally mind, mind blowing. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later or a couple of months later, the, a newspaper came through the uh, front door. I lived in Tottenham then. And the newspaper came through the front door, free newspaper, fallen open on the mat, and it's like tabla lessons, little advert for tabla lessons. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So, so I went down, that was that. Initially, just to complement my drum set playing. Yeah. But one of the complexities of everything about the music and the way the drums are played and literally everything, um, it's very hard, unless you've studied it for a long time, to envisage any way... That you can orchestrate it on on percussion and, and drum set and, and it took me years and it was only really when i went through my educational workshops and stuff like that i developed the indian rhythms for drum set books yeah. um so that's you know the years and years later that actually came full circle and i could see some way to to actually um you know develop the material and, and play it on on other percussion but as you say it was, it's a long study it's like you know, I had a six-year period with 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 uh, with my Indian studies where I'd have four four-hour lessons a week, and and that's all I did. I didn't work. I didn't do anything. I just did that and practiced the whole time. You know, so it was six years, and that that's kind of, you know, and I would still describe myself as a baby in the, as a as a tabla player, or you know, I, you know, I'd say I know the basics. Really, it's that it's that complex the the music and the and the tradition and the technique. And I'd, I'd imagine it's quite unusual for you know a, a white English guy to be playing the instrument anyway. Is it? Is it from your contemporaries? Is it kind of do they see it as unusual, or is it? Is there lots? I don't know. There might be lots of guys who do it. Because yeah, well, I think what I do on, on it is unusual in the sense that you know, I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, we the Westerners that learn Indian music kind of go the whole the whole hog and do you know the traditional thing in in you know completely turn themselves over to that mm. and they do that but for me it was always a of course I learned it properly traditionally I think that's really super important it's not like a, a cherry on top of the cake you know it's like serious study serious 
in-depth knowledge of North and, and South Indian. But it was always my objective, even though I did play classical gigs on, in both North and South yeah. Indian music in the beginning, was that was never my objective. My objective was to have it as another string to my bow, as, an, as another, um, what would you say, artistic influencer, like a point of, of um, inspiration and, and something to... Um, springboard from with ideas and 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 so when you take that and like you said the Swiss Army Knife thing of studying other music from around the world and seeing how that can all kind of fit together and influence one another you know both with techniques split hand technique for example on on South Indian and North Indian um, drums working on for example cajon um, and you know darabuka technique and, and different techniques and different musical styles fitting together to make a kind of new hybrid voice. So I think that's, that's unusual. Yeah. You know? And that's one of the things that, because I've, I've traveled a lot and, and um, you know, released a lot of albums in, in India. I think it's like 15 in, in, in total, you know, released with, with either solo albums or collaborations with Indian classical and, and folk artists. But one of the things that, that I found they responded the best to, or the reason that, that they invited me into so many, continue to invite me into so many things, is that they really like um, someone who's taking their music and then reinterpreting it and, and you know, presenting it in a, in a light that maybe they haven't thought of. Going back to what I said about Thomas, you know, what, you know, one of the many things that's so great about, um, you know, working with Thomas in that collaboration is his reinterpretation of the material. Yeah. You know, and I deliberately didn't tell him that much technical stuff about how it would be approached in a traditional sense, yeah. because I wanted to see like a pure, um, pure interpretation of it. So yes, it is. So yeah, it, it's unusual in in a in many ways. But I, I can imagine, you know, they, they must love the fact that you've given this instrument the respect and you've 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 upheld its traditions. And as you say, yeah. you've re, reinvented it to a certain extent, let's say, um, which yeah. I, 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 I think it's fabulous. And just the commitment alone is just mind blowing. You know, it's not something you just sit down for half an hour and go, yeah, OK, I can get away with that. It's, it's, you know, exactly. it's mind blowing. It really is. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a full on commitment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really, really, especially as as uh, as an alien to the music, you know, because it's not only about learning the music. Like, for example, if someone comes to you as a 10 year old and says, I want to have drum lessons. See, they already know there's so much blind knowledge in them already at that point of seeing people like this, for example, at the drum set and doing this and how it's set up and lots of different things. Whereas if you go to, uh, you know, music from another culture and you know nothing about it, mm. not only do you know nothing about, about the music, you know, nothing about, about the culture, about all of the formalities, um, you know, everything that makes up that, you know, to be part of that to, and to go in and learn it, it, you know, that that makes it a kind of almost like a triple challenge in a way. I just can't I just can't imagine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I was dedicated enough to to put that amount of effort. In. And let's not forget, this is this is kind of stuff you are fitting in around gigging and, and other things as well. And you don't get paid for doing this, do you? This is this is just. In, yeah, certainly in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a, you know it's a, it's a it's a passion and a, and a love. You know, as as we, as we're all of our musical community is all of our drumming community, and you know it's it's the passion and the love of, of yeah. you know playing the music. And I, and what I would add to that as well is that you know okay, I've studied a lot of of a particular type of music, and and you know for my particular ends, that's what I wanted to do. But to be part of the music world, you know, to play music. You know, when I was when I was starting out in the, in the punk band um, in Portsmouth, you know, I had I had no technique, but it was, you know, well, it was a completely different thing. It was it was a complete life changing event discovering music. So the thing that I want to say is, regardless of the level of technique that someone's at, it's it's not that it's that's I mean it's relevant to a point, but it's not relevant in the experience and the love of music by that person that's playing the music. So, you know, I see music as, you know, something that everyone in the community um, can equally be involved in and benefit from and enjoy, you know, and, and be respected for in, in their, for whatever they, how, however they contribute. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a valid point. It really is. And, you know, 
you know, there's enough there for everyone to get involved, isn't there, and get some joy from it. Now, you're, you're, the, you're, you're, the, you're the collaboration king. And, and uh, you know, you've done so much with, and so much diverse, you know, um, styles, you know, and, and other musicians are very diverse as well, which is great. But obviously you've done lots of recording with um, folks, uh, Bjork, Robert Plant, Peter Gabriel, the list goes on and on, lots of um, yeah. the Bond movies. Are you, do you get more satisfaction from doing the collaboration stuff or actually playing with artists? What's your, what's your sort of... Yeah, yeah, it's a good thought? question. I mean, for me, I mean, I don't really... I, I've stopped staying in touch with all the people that I did sessions with. And I mean, that world very much is, you know, you're staying in touch every few weeks with people and doing, and it's not that I didn't enjoy it. Um, but, you know, for me, the whole, the whole point of it is, is the, um, and it's, it's going to sound pretentious, but it's not meant to be, is the artistic expression of what you do. For me, that's the, for me personally, and, just my personally that's the most important thing and I can get to that um through my collaborations and through composing and performing and performing solo or, or you know like with Thomas or yeah. different things like that but the from the real meat of it and I, it's, it's interesting with lockdown and everything <clears throat> and and not being on the road for for, for 18 months has made me realize something that I, that I didn't really realize before um and the realization there was a light shone on it um, a couple of nights ago. Um, I was listening. I've got an uh, I've got a few out, new albums coming out in in the next couple of days. Yeah. Um, archive material. We'll talk about that uh, later on. But one of them is is uh, um, uh, all, only done on the ATV A frame, which is yeah. an electronic electronic, a very cool very cool instrument yeah. with loopers and the whole thing. And it was recorded in Japan, and. Um, you know, there's I think there's the nine tracks and like five of them are in the studio and four of them are live. And it was really interesting listening through to it. I was listening to it with my wife, who's a great musician, great pianist. Um, and it's really interesting because you listen to the studio ones and they're, they're fine. You know, I'm, I'm happy with the performances. I'm happy with what we recorded and, and everything. Um, but then you listen to the live ones and there's something else. There's a, a, a spirit in it that isn't in the in the studio ones. Hmm. Um, you know, you, maybe the novice listener wouldn't necessarily notice it, but for me, I notice it because I I performed it. And it and what it it is is um, the the vibe that you know comes from performing live, being in front of an audience with an audience, interacting. That cycle. Um, yeah, cyclic thing between audience and performer um, you know that is that's the key to why I do it that's that that moment on stage with an audience as long as they're not throwing tomatoes at you <laughs> it's like okay, in that case I'll go for the studio uh, yeah of course you know but you know for on, on a on a, a good gig where you know you feel there's some sort of relationship with you and, and the audience um, with what you're presenting, you know, artistically, yeah. you know, that's the, the key component of, it's the key component of why I do it. And I think I'd never really realised it before because my whole career as it's developed has been a big um, mixture of so many different things. There's been the live stuff, you know, my app, the books, the, you know, uh, recording, you know, um, library music and sessions and film music and, loads of different things that are all, all get churned into the mix and you kind of see them all traveling through at the same time. But then only one, when one of them's gone, the, the most important one, um, you realize that actually the rest of it is just, it's kind of just the crumbs yeah. or the, or just the, the crackers on the table and not the, not the meal. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it, it's for me having then reflecting back and seeing the decisions that I've made, I mean, I made a decision pretty early on to not do any, uh, you know, it's not out of a judgment, judgmental thing. I just didn't like touring with with pop bands or yeah. bands, you know, not not performing, um, you know, my music. I, I didn't particularly enjoy it. So I didn't do it. I stopped doing it. Studio sessions were fine because you'd be in there for, you know, either a day or a week and you're done and, and you're on your way. And, you know, I always say about sessions is when you go in as, a, you know, if you're a, 
a decent session player, um, particularly, you know, whatever instrument it is, you're, you're the producer's sound module. That's how I would think of it psychologically. You, rather than having a pretentious attitude of, oh, this is how the tablers played or, you know, this is how South, forget any of it. They want me to, you know, you know, tap the kanjira on a fridge. I'll do it if that's the sound they want. You know, I'm, I'm their sound module when I go into the studio. Um, and although I enjoyed that, I didn't really get much out of it spiritually. And so that's why, you know, for me, focusing on, on uh, you know, the, the collaborations was, was made, made more sense to me, even though I didn't quite realise um, the depth of that decision at the time. Well, it, you know, it, they've been fascinating to watch, especially over the last um, 18 months or so. You've been uploading them and they're just, they're so interesting. They really are. And it's, it's kind of cheered up a miserable lockdown, really. So it's, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and speak, speaking of um, collaborations, there's, a, there's an album I love that you did, uh, Luis Conte, uh, Boom, which I think is just... Yeah, Boom, yeah. Beautiful album, it really is. Um, now, uh, there's a, there's a tr there's a track on there, um, the weight of time. I, I'm I'm assuming that's Kanjira on there. Exactly. Beautiful, yeah. and I, I I'm guessing that's probably one of your favourite instruments. From uh, I see a lot of it, and it sounds. Yeah, I mean it's funny because I do get that question quite a lot. What's your what's your favourite instrument? And it's not, what I always say is. Um, you know, I mean, I, I suppose if I had to go to the moon and take a couple of things, Kanjira would probably be one of them with the, yep. the tablet, you know. But I always say, you know, it's my family. You know, yeah. it's like I, like someone saying to a parent, which is your favourite kid? And they're like, oh, no, actually, it's, 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 it's little Billy. <laughs> so I, t I tend not to do it, not quite so much for that, but because I because conceptually I kind of think of it as a... As a um, uh, I, I think of it as my percussion family and myself as a as a multi percussionist. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, obviously, tabla kanjira, the South Indian thing is is the north north and South Indian thing is something that I've studied in depth. So um, definitely, um, I mean, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful album, and um, it's such well, a, think such a fascinating little drum, isn't it? Because it's not it's not huge by any means, and, and yeah. So, but the stuff you do on it, and it's just well, you've um, I think I'm right. You've done a book on Kanjira, is that right? Um, did you do a book? Yeah, yeah. The book just came out, um, I think, last year mm. on Hudson Music. And, and you, a completely different approach to it because, like, a lot of the other, any other material, you, there's not that much on Kanjira, to be honest, but pretty much the way that you would learn it is you'd learn in a traditional sense of, of the instrument. You'd learn the different time cycles and patterns and compositions within that that... that lead you to how you would play the drum traditionally but but with this book i wanted to do it more like a a, a western drum book mm -hmm. so it's it's building up from the basics and then doing certain grooves and certain different ways of of uh, you know uh, building up basic techniques on the instrument without specifically you know, it's a good building uh, you know uh, starting point or springboard if you wanted to uh, you know, play traditional South Indian music, then it's a good entry to that. But if you wanted to use it, you know, in a funk band or something or, or other stuff, then it's kind of a really good doorway into that. So it's kind of like a, a two hinged doorway. Yeah. There you go. Well, hey, it's, <laughs> great. it's a great answer. It's, it's one of those instruments that I've been toying with the idea of buying for five or six oh, months. Definitely. I'm, definitely. I'm, I'm like, oh, dirty. <laughs> so there we go. I might, uh, I'll get the book as well. And then, uh, you know. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you know, you can take it anywhere. You know, even if even if um, you know you could put like a, a, a little bit of cloth inside it if it's if it's late at night and you, no one will even hear it. You know, yeah, wonderful. So you can practice anytime. Take it on in the car with you when you're stuck in stuck in traffic on the M25. You can be driving round and round practicing the camp. No, you. I, I didn't say that. I'll get convicted for someone <laughs> careering off the. Uh, don't try this at home, folks. No, you, <laughs> you can't use your phone, but playing the kanjira is fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, a, a book of yours that I love and I've used uh, is Independence Alphabet, which I think is a terrific book. I don't know how how old is it, Pete? Now that that's that's my most recent book. That, that's uh, most recent one, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's a few months, six months, six months in. Man. All right. Oh, I felt felt like I had it longer, but there we go. I thought it was yeah. older than that. Wonderful book, and it's it's a challenge as well. My students hate it, by the way, but. Um, <laughs> So take that as a compliment. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things with that book, I wanted to do with it because a lot of the other stuff that I've written is, is you kind of, you know, start at the beginning and work your way towards the end. I, lo- I like the idea of this being, I mean, once you've got the, the basics down in the beginning, it's, you can be an absolute beginner and, and start out with the book. Once you've got the basics down, or you have basic technique anyway, then you can just dip into the book, you know, pick a page at random and, and work on a, you know, on a, a bit like um, I, had, I had a book of Zen, Zen and it was a little book like this and it was split into two halves. It, every page was cut in two. And so you open it randomly and you get a combination of two different Zen thoughts, you know. Oh, that's not yes. Practice more, practice less. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they'll get you going. But uh-huh. anyway, I want it to be like that. The pages aren't split in half, of course. But the idea that you can just dip into it, take take a couple of ideas out, and then work them, orchestrate them on the drum set, and you know, it's just independence for for two for two voices mostly. But then I do foot, add foot ostinatos and you know, left foot, right foot stuff and something like that. So it actually become by the end of it, you know, it's it's pretty challenging by the end of it. Yeah, it's one of those books you can make it as hard or as simple as you like, really, isn't it? And uh, it's it's fab- fabulous yeah. book. One I I enjoy absolutely. Yeah, been into both as a teacher and as a as a player, you know. So it's uh, and this this sorry about well, all these questions right. about this. But there's another thing that interests me, and this is the uh, the, drum, oh. the drum jam app. Right. Yeah. T- tell that, us about that. That's, I've had that for. Well, that came about. That's been that's been out four or five years now, and it's with uh, uh, I've got a partner in Washington, Jesse Chapel. There's a company called Sonosaurus, and he's a, a genius. He's just like an amazing, um, amazing app wizard. One of the first people um, to get into music apps. In fact, Jordan Budis as well was was uh, one of the first people with his with his app. He was a beta tester on on. Uh, on drum jam which was which was really really right. helpful but I, I had this idea of i don't know if you remember there was an app called urban spoon um and it's like a, a fruit machine for restaurants so wherever you were you know you, it will pick up your location you'd shake it up and it would come up with three different restaurants near you <laughs> so you know so i thought what about if that was different rhythm patterns like a shaker and a cowbell and a timbali or something and then you shake it up and you get so that's how it started and then it kind of blossomed into that, um, it, you know, that idea with a lot more complexity, but then also with um, some solo pads. So you can flick over once you've got your loops going. It's all acoustic audio. It's all me playing um, the, the loops. Well, you flick over to the uh, to the solo pad page and then you can play along, you know, play along with it. And I mean, it's pretty um, it's pretty convincing. I'll, I'll play you something on the yeah, on the. Um, on the tablet. I mean, obviously, it's just going to be, um, you know, on the on the on the speaker here. But yeah, so uh, I mean, when it when it on the last update, it was, um, you know, it was top top five in forty countries for wow. about a week. That's good. So it was, you know, it was pretty. Um, you know, it does pretty well. All this stuff you can use on your phone and can you um so is this something you can use live then oh absolutely yeah but i mean it, it, the thing about it is it's um well first of all you can record everything so it will co- record and export a 16-bit WAV, and it's all um you know it, recorded in the in the uh, studio so it's all proper it's not midi percussion it's proper stuff um you know i mean it's literally tens of thousands of loops actually when you get all the in-app purchases and stuff like that and then all of the solo pads are you know like i've got kits by russ miller johnny rab kj sorker steve sedelnik you know loads and loads of of drummers kits and they're all like 20 30 layers velocity deep yeah. and then loads and loads of instruments like the tablet that, that i was just showing you and loads of other stuff um and of course, then there's loads of effects and loads of different stuff that you can put into it. So you can record that as as WAV files. You can also trigger all these sounds um, if you've got the you know the the device to translate it. You can trigger it all with uh, with your electronic drums. So it basically it's a sound module as well. But as a sound module, this has got 
with all the, with all the in-app purchases and everything, it's, I mean, it's literally hundreds and hundreds of, of multi, like, multi-velocity level, uh, multi-velocity recorded, um, you know, instruments. So, yeah, it, wow. a lot of people use it professionally. But the other thing is sometimes I'll get, uh, you know, an uh, email from um, someone in a hospital and stuff saying, oh, you know, such and such a patient has, has had, you know, problems moving and, they, you know, they've had an operation, but they're really enjoying your app because they can just drag the finger on the, on the sounds and it creates, creates different things. Um, one of the other things that I wanted about the app, and this is kind of abstract slightly from, um, you know, from the, the, the technicality of it and the, and the usability, mm. besides it just being fun for people, I wanted it to be an intro- introduction to the sounds. Yeah. So when, you know, when someone says Tableau or like Kanjira, like you just said, or different instruments, they think like, you know, not necessarily sure exactly what it sounds like. So they can get the, the, the solo pad up or the loops and, and play it and get a real good idea of, of, you know, the different tones and sounds on the, on the different instruments. Wow, an amazing thing. You, you said people are using it professionally. I'm assuming once you've bought the purchase, you can use this license free uh, on whatever, I guess. Is that yeah, yeah. It it's, I think it's $6.99 for the app or $5.99. I can't, I can't remember exactly, you know, um, like $9.99 in, in the US dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, you buy it and that's it. It's yours. You do whatever you want with it. Absolutely. And of course, then you get more and more sounds if you buy. It's already loaded with a lot of sounds, yeah. but, you, you know, you, you, you can buy loads and loads of other sounds. They're only a dollar a pop. So, you know, you can get six either loop sets or instruments for a dollar. You know, it's crazy. You know, if you think yeah, that was a sample CD, you know, if this was a sample CD, it would be a box set of, you know, well, it'd be like a, a, a hard drive. You'd have to buy a hard drive to, to fit it all on. Wow, I tell you, it's incredible value, isn't it? Absolutely yeah, incredible. That's uh, there's yeah. no reason not to have it. Let's be honest. No reason not to have it, and we're we're doing a, we're bringing out a new um, audio unit version of the pads, which should be out early early next year. So then that works, um, you know, because this is quite you know it's four or five years old. It was built in a way that's difficult to make it. Um, difficult to convert it without completely rebuilding it uh, convert it as as an audio unit um but we can abstract the pads and then have that as an audio unit an audio unit works um you know within you, you know your your um uh, ios daw or whatever whether it's cubasis or or a garage band or or whatever wow what a bit of technology eh yeah i'm i'm, I'm proud of it actually and yeah. jesse's amazing like the genius of of app development, you know. Wow, and you know, I'll change the subject ever so slightly. It's uh, rather less technology involved, but your um, new Vic Firth remix brushes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something that I'm I'm really really proud of as well, actually. And that that came out. I mean, actually, it came out just before COVID. Yeah. So what was that? That was Nam 2019, I suppose. It was launched, yeah. um, and then. Um, kind of organic brushes so they come in there's four different um, grades of like a, a thin grass a medium grass a birch and a rattan and the idea is that you you put them together in pairs so for example if you get um, other other brushes that you might find on on drums I don't mean jazz brushes I mean like the brooms and stuff like that mm. is that you can play something and it will sound great on the snare drum but as soon as you go to a ride cymbal or hi-hat you, you can't really hear them. Yeah, yeah. It's just got the attack and the definition. So I had the idea of putting different uh, brushes together. So you've got a soft broom, uh, you know, brush, but then behind it, you put a birch. So you put them together as pairs. Yeah. You put the birch one behind it or the rattan one behind it, which is even harder. So then first of all, you get a bit more attack when you hit harder. So you've got soft grass if you hit quietly, but then more attack and more beef behind it if you hit uh, if you hit harder but then you can flip it over so you can be getting that soft you know um, grass type sound on the snare or whatever you whatever you're playing but then you can flip it over so then you've got definition on on cymbals and stuff like that so you know and luckily you know it, it did really well it got it was percussion instrument of the show at that nan show which you know i'm particularly proud of you know especially because you go to a show like that you know, the first time I went there and it's just like so huge and it's just 
this infinite flow of people and things and objects and products and stuff. And so to go there a few years later and get like one of the things that you've designed, yeah. um, as the, you know, the product of the show in that category was like, it, was, it shocked me to be honest. It was a little still coming to terms with it in terms of a, um, you know, like a, a product. Yeah. So obviously the idea, the whole concept was your, your thing. That's you went to Vic Firth and said, this, this is what I exactly. want. Yeah, I've been I've been making them for years out of yeah. lots of different things, you know, like um, some of those bamboo blinds that you pull down. I kind of take them apart and then stick them together with different things, and, and then put different ones that you put together. So I've been using it in the studio for years, hmm. twenty more than twenty years actually. In, wow. in uh, and yeah, I mean, and I took it to Vic, and and they they loved it. And you know, one of the things is when you you know if you do have an idea, product idea, and you take it to a company. You've got to make it as accessible as possible. So even though I built the um, prototypes, without me doing the videos, I did some in-depth videos about all the combinations and everything you could do. Only through doing that did they really understand what it was. Mm. You know, so you know if you are going to um, pitch an idea to a company, and I'd say go in, into as much detail as 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 possible, and and you know videos and all that stuff, yeah. you know. Because I often, when people have a signature, anything, be it a snare drum, a cymbal, sticks, mm. I often wonder how much has gone into it from the artist. I'm sure it has with some, but I'm, I get the impression with a few, maybe very little, you know? So it's nice to hear that you've actually, yeah. you've cobbled something together yourself and gone and said, look, this is it. Exactly, exactly. Although, the, you know, the thing is, it's not, I, I, when I sent it to them mm. and when we discussed how we were going to do it, I, I said, don't make it a signature product. I mean, it sounds crazy, and every artist wants signature products. And of course, I've got my signature drumstick with with, uh, with Vic Firth. But I said, don't make it a signature product because it won't sell as many. You know, unless you're Steve Gadd or, or Dave Weckl or, you know, someone like that, people will buy, buy those sticks for the name. But in terms of, you know, your, your average working percussionist, it sales would be less if it had my name on it. Not because they don't like what I do or maybe some people don't which is fine but it's because it's got, it's got a name on it and you want you know if it's just Vic Firth remix brushes then you make them personally your own and you do your own own music with them you know so I think it's just it's better for sales not to not to have it as a signature product that's really interesting I've never I've never heard of, of, of that idea before and it, it makes sense doesn't it when you when you think about it I suppose I've got a couple of other things coming out with, I've got some stuff with, uh, with Groove X coming out, you know, Russ Miller's yeah. company that may do the, the, you know, the wedges and the, the really brilliant, brilliant stuff. I've got some things coming out with them or things that we've got in development anyway. And um, it's the same thing, you know, I, I'm, I don't want it as a signature product yeah. because uh, it's better to, better to, um, you know, better to sell more than, than inflate your ego. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know, um, you've got this band camp thing happening as well. You know, you mentioned about the albums that you've recorded and there's a, there's a yeah. lot of them. So, so do you want to talk about, can you talk about the band camp thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a new thing for me and it's, it's just going to be launched, um, you know, probably sometime around, you know, I mean, it'll be in a few days. So I guess it might coincide a little bit with, with when you, when you publish the, sure. publish the interview or the, the, the our chat, you know, um, so yeah, it's a new it's a new thing for me, and it, it, I mean, with you know Spotify and streaming generally, you know you don't really get uh, the the royalties are you know you got to have so many people stream your stuff to actually make any money out of it. Yeah. But it makes more sense to make it directly available. So I've put a lot of my old uh, you know previously released albums on there. There's a lot of, I've got about eighteen on there at the moment. Yeah. Um, but there's three new ones that I'm going to launch yeah. um, when I when I put the make the page live, and they're kind of like from the archives. So there's there's three, you know, three new albums. First of all, the A-frame one that I was telling you about, just but you know, performed entirely on the A-frame. Yeah. Um, with a looper and, and effects pedals and stuff like that. But you know, that was that's the first one. And then there's a project that I did in um, in Azerbaijan a few years ago that I've never released. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to put that out there. And then um, there's an album that's, that I've called Hooked on Phonetics. And it's kind of 
a few collaborations and a few solo things. So there's some tabla, um, Eunice and tabla things that I've, that I've done that I'm, that I'm putting up. Some different collaborations. There's one with uh, with El Negro, um, one with Bernard Lackner, the bass bass player, one with Panos, the great drummer from from Athens. You know, so there's quite a lot of different stuff on on all of those three albums. So I'm going to put them out in one go, and they're only going to be available on Bandcamp. I'm not going to put them on 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 you know my publisher and, and all that. I'm just going to keep it on on um, uh, on Bandcamp yeah. solely. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. It's a great idea. It's the, you know, in a way, it's the ha, ha, in a, as musicians, we've got to try and and get in there and support each other directly especially now with with um the the industry as it is at the moment with covid and also with technology developing in the way that it has which which means that people don't really buy cds anymore no. as such so you're going to sell a cd through itunes maybe or through or people will stream it or whatever so you've kind of lost that direct income that you would you know i mean i can remember going off when in the beginning I suppose, you know, 25, um, 25 to 30 years ago when you'd go off and you'd go off and you tour in Europe and you know, you'd do 100 CDs a night. And, it, you know, that makes quite a significant difference to your, to your income stream, mm. you know. I mean, you know, you, you'd get, you know, maybe, and you could aim for 10 to 20% of the audience buying a CD if it was a, if it was a good gig, you know. So if you had 1,000 people, you know, or, or 500 people, you know, you, 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 you can do fairly decently out of it. But of course, that's gone now. People, I mean, young people don't even don't even know what a CD is. I did a drum festival in, in Holland um, in The Hague a few years ago. And there were, you know, some amazing drum set players, you know, incredibly famous drum set players on the on the um, on the festival. They all had CDs. And, you know, we were all out there at the desk, you know, after our performances and after the in the middle of the day signing and stuff like that and not a single one of them sold a cd it's not one of them and it's just like wow really that's just incredible so that's gone yeah. the, like the cd thing is gone so you've got to find different ways to to uh um you know create create another income stream and i think Bandcamp. i think if musicians can get the idea of let's all get on Bandcamp, yeah you know and and buy direct then and, all the musicians will be a winner so you know it makes total sense to me to try and support that totally well that website wish you all the best with that one so yeah um so uh, you know you've done as as i mentioned before you are the swiss army knife of percussion uh edward scissorhands yeah. <laughs> anything um interesting coming up pete that that that, that we can talk about yeah, well, you know, moving moving house at the moment, that's like taking oh. up. And a lot of my stuff's in storage, so that's really, really awkward in terms of, uh, like, recording and de developing yeah. developing new projects. But, you know, you know, writing different different uh, collaborations, um, different trying to, you know, you're trying to think of things that, that uh, you know, are going to um, keep you excited you know that's the that's the crux of it i think that's one of the difficulties that we've got at the moment is that you know a lot of people are, are, are stuck at home and they're not doing gigs and they're not you know and so how can you kind of develop things you know that keep you excited so there's some you know, interesting um collaborations like uh, one with uh, an organ player uh willem tanke and um and dave liebman and we've been doing some bits of recording on that and yeah. you know various things really Good. so Good. trying to trying to keep uh, positive but really in a way i'm kind of thinking of 2022 as i suppose not a sabbatical year but it's a year you know i'm going to be moving home i i, I can't really see i mean maybe i mean because i'm not this i'm not a sort of gigging musician in the sense that I go out and I play with bands and I do that. I mean, I do my solo thing, not because I, I don't, you know, enjoy that a lot or, you know, like that. It's just, it's not what I do. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I tend to focus on my own compositions and my own solo thing. So in, in that sense, that means there's not that many, um, you know, events and, and different things, you know? Um, so yeah, can't try and keep it 
interesting. And, you know, one of the most exciting projects for me at the moment is the um, uh, duo with uh, Peter John Vitesi, who's an amazing, amazing keyboard player. Yes. I've got uh, um, a, 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 a motivator and supporter, I would say, someone called Paul Cameron, who's uh, himself a great, great percussionist. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now, you know, a, a businessman in, a, in another area, but he's behind the project. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of putting a lot of different moody soundscape stuff together. So that's that's something that I'm really, really excited about. Lock it for Test Band. Yes. It, yeah. it's, uh, it's cool. So I, I'll, I'll make sure you get a link to that as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Pete. That's amazing. And, and I've often wondered, right, um, as, a, as a fabulous percussionist and a, and a great drummer as well, is there, you know, you're in your house at the moment. Do you always have something lying around that you can pick up? And is, there, is, is are you one of those guys or do you keep your, do you keep music separate from the house? Are you, are you one of these? No, no, it's very much, I mean, it, it's very much in the house, actually. Yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons, you know, that we're moving from central London out a little bit. So to get a bigger, you know, build a, a actual studio and, and stuff like that. I think the, the thing at the moment is, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, and I've got to be, you know, honest with it. You know, you're kind of 18 months into into this and, you know, it's it's kind of, um, you know, it can be a little bit difficult to get motivation to do anything, really, because you you kind of like had your head chopped off with it all. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty despairing. So much as, you know, I mean, I suppose the first, I suppose the first year, I didn't really, it didn't, I carried on. I wrote books. I, I wrote, oh, I've written three books. One of them's not out, actually. Uh, I'm writing a book with Steve Smith at the moment. Oh. Um, and that's, you know, we, we're quite well well along with that. Yeah. Um, so I was writing stuff. I was doing, you know, various recording and, and different things. But then you get to a point where the gigs aren't there and your kind of main motivating factor's not there. So, you know, I think there's a pressure on us as humans as individuals especially if you've been motivated and driven at some point in your life to you know to be a musician we all are motivated and driven to having practiced and got to where we're at there's a kind of thing of that I've got to be doing something you know I've got to be doing something all the time yeah. and for me if if you're not motivated to do it you know you've lost your the main energy your main productive energy is gone and that's why sometimes when you know, you, you'll see people talk about practice and, and, you know, you've got to practice, you've got to do this, blah, blah, blah. You've got to be, you know, disciplined, the word discipline. Mm. See, I, I don't necessarily think of it in terms of discipline, because if you have to be disciplined, it means you're forcing yourself to do it. Yeah. You know, so I, I tend to, and if, in fact, I suppose I've always been like this, is that I practice and I create when I'm inspired and yeah. motivated to do. Otherwise, I'm faking it, you know. And so I'm at the moment, obviously, where, you know, there's no gigs and there's no... So I, everything I'm doing, I'm kind of thinking technically, like the band camp thing and, the, you know, the, the new app uh, thing coming out. And I've got a, um, a pack coming out with, with another app, a, an app called Synced, okay. which is a, a programmable metronome. And I've got an Indian pack uh, coming out with them. And Andy is, is great. It's got some really great ideas with that app. So, I, you know, I've sort of I've been doing quite a lot with that um, and kind of getting all these technical things done. So, yeah, just being quite honest, because I'm sure a lot of people, um, you know, maybe they don't feel, you know, obviously everyone's going to be pretty down with WhatsApp, especially with the new, you know, um, segue that we've yeah. had the last, you know, few, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is, but you just got to be honest about it, I think, and and speak to people about it and, and um, you know, try and, look on the bright side of life, as Monty Python said. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Pete, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. That's, that's a nice sentiment to end on, I think. Uh, Fantastic. It's been, uh, a, I don't know how long we've been talking. Oh, we go. We've been talking for an hour. That's gone like about 10 minutes. So um, <laughs> you have to play one and a half times the speed and then it will be, uh, only, no, it'll be 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so look, thanks for taking the time out to do it. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, mate. And um, good luck with the house move. Fantastic. Thanks, Matty. And we'll see.